Okay, hi there. What we're going to try and do here is explain nodal workflow a bit for the artist brain, try and demystify some of the tools and tricks working nodally, and also some of the math operators that we encounter, and also, of course, that we see other people using a lot in different nodal networks. And we're going to try to understand how all of these things work graphically, so as we can think more easily about the end visual effect that using any given node somewhere is going to have on, you know, the outcome of whatever we're doing. A lot of artists find this sort of thing hard to grasp. They think it's, you know, technical or mathy, number whatever. You know, they see ice flows and Houdini and all of that and, you know, forget about it. So, first place to start is with something that's more artist-friendly, at least more traditionally artist-recognized, um, which is, you know, good old Photoshop here, and two images in two layers, and we've got this black and white procedural, um, and if we set it to multiply, then we can see what it does to the image, you know, the black areas of the procedural cause the image to get darker, and the light areas allow the, you know, brightness to stay the same, and there we go, and we can, you know, vary its opacity up and down, and, you know, we understand that plainly enough. What we're told if we ask technically is multiply, the color values are being multiplied with one another, so it's red type, so it's layer one red times background red, layer two green times background green, etc, etc. But for the most part as artists we don't really care about that because of course we just twiddle the old opacity, you know, dial here and we can see what's happening visually, it makes a lot of sense. And for that reason we don't really care about the whole math of multiplying what's going on that much because it's a very simple bit of equation anyway and we don't need to do it obviously Photoshop does it for us and we've got a clear visual understanding of what it does so that's fine we can just work with it no problem now when you're working in nodes the process is essentially no different here I've got a color texture over here we can see I've got this procedural and when you have one multiplied by the other you get this so although the layout and the fact that we're not using layers anymore is slightly different the process is exactly the same and so are the terms now in Photoshop when you do this and you've got one thing multiplying over another in a layer type way then what what you're really getting is the color and the brightness and so on and so forth. All of these things are getting multiplied the same way. Multiply is a very broad stroke. In nodal, it could be more refined. This is the first point about the whole nodal interface itself and the strengths that it brings. Different nodes give access to different data types. For instance, in the image node here, it has four different output ports representing different component parts of the image or the image represented in different ways. It also has input ports for controlling different aspects of the image, its placement, its mapping and so forth. And that means that you can start working with each of these different things individually to build up a more complex form of adjustment to everything. Mix in more procedurals and build an image just the same way you do in Photoshop but with more flexibility in the sense that you're able to build little mini networks to create an overall result and then pipe that into another mixer that's also mixing from another mini network of nodes and so on to build up more and more complex surface particle effect motions or whatever the heck else you're using nodal for. And so since throughout this we're going to be talking about these sorts of things a lot, data type, and these sorts of things, operators or functions, then the best I can put it into any kind of sense for the artists is this. Data types that are accessible in nodes are like colors. Functions and operators and so forth are the brushes that are used. And that's really all there is to it. That's the entire node editor for. You will probably have ancillary nodes as well, for instance, like gradients, which are more similar to tools like the palette which you mix colors on. But in an artistic sense, that's all there is to a nodal network, including the supposedly difficult math aspects of it. Because you don't have to do the math yourself. You just have to have a rough idea of what it's trying to do and let the brush do it for you. And once you see things in these sorts of terms, you'll find it far easier to apply your artistic mind and skill set to creating because the different parts will have a visual meaning. And the question of how does someone know to use this kind of node or that kind of math function on a vector to achieve a certain effect, just know how to do it, will become more the sorts of thing learn to do by yourself by using the basics you do know and building on that and experimenting. For instance, you might traditionally have yellow and blue together. Each of these is just a data type, a color data, and through intermixing, comparison, etc., etc., relation to one another in some form, green can be produced. In fact, if you consider this space as a palette board, you could say that green is a color that exists on it waiting to be used. Even though you can't see it, it's still there. And you can visually imagine its presence in the scene, as it were. Well, scenes in 3D are full of different data types. There's stuff all over the place, information about all sorts. For instance, in my spot info node example, of changing the shading of the sphere based on the location of a null, what I've got is, of course, I've got the 
edge surface of my sphere here and it's you know its origin is over there somewhere and all of the points on the surface of the sphere represent little pieces of data and those pieces of data are the vectors that exist between each point and the origin you know there's vectors all over this thing I can sample any of these little points for pieces of information what color light they're receiving what angle is that light coming in at I can take the measurements of the vectors between the points and the origin in terms of their magnitude I can take it in terms of their angle. These are vectors and they're present everywhere in your 3D scene on any geometric mesh or surface or anything of that nature. With particles flying through space, they've all got properties. In the case of particles, you've got the acceleration of the particle, which direction it's flying in, all sorts of such things. There are a great many data types, a huge number of colors to paint with, and you get access to all of those in a node editor. And even though in the node editor they might seem difficult, they've all got very simple visual representations of what the data type is. And it's very easy to see how manipulating it with another data type produces some other kind of effect and so on. So that's great. All of these different data types that you can find in your scene, they're wonderful and numerous and that's why there's so many nodes in these node editors because you can literally look at anything and the very basic pieces of information that make it that thing but what about the operators things like the multiply after all how do you get a visual representation of you know square root or cosine or dot products how do we represent this stuff visually doesn't seem quite so simple especially once we get into the more mathy ones or what seem to be the more mathy ones and start talking about vector blah 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 in a sense different than we're talking about here actually working with them together in a mathematical sense. The truth is that these things do have visual representation, very, very simple visual representation. And we'll see some of those and how they work as well, which will help us no end once we get into Node Editor and using these types of functions. Now, the example that I used in my tutorial on the spot info node of using a null's position to control the shading of a sphere is a particularly good example to take apart for the purposes of demonstrating these principles nice and clear. So, first thing, if you remember, what we're trying to do is to trying to shade a given spot on the surface of the sphere as a certain color. And as other spots on the sphere's surface move away from that position, they fade through to a different color. That, of course, is a gradient, and we've got one set up here. And this is based on the input of the Y coordinate, that being, of course, of the surface itself. The Y here is at zero, and at that is black, and then at some point, we get to 1 and it is white. Um, in this particular example, 1 in my node editor is being interpreted as 1 meter, so this sphere is like 2 odd. Or in radius, I should, or in radius, I should say. Anyhow, once we reach the 1 meter point above the ground on the y axis, it is shaded white, and there's our gradient between those two points of 0 and 1. You can, of course, say adjust that to 3 meters there and bring it out to alter where the gradient falls. That's easy for everyone and we get that no problem. Now how to make that point dependent upon a null so as the one point isn't just at the uppermost part of this value it's in the direction of that null. Well what we've got is a color mix that's a data type our gradient and it has an input which is a data type specifically it's a scalar almost all node editors will have data types grouped into sections for instance here I have in green scalars these are just any old number, 1, 7, 246.9, etc., etc., whatever. Positive, negative, that's a scalar. We have color, which is obviously an RGB. Same for the shading, this being a surface input. Normal and bump, which are, of course, vector inputs, more scalars, and so on. So the input in this case is the Y coordinate in meters, going 0, 1, 2, 3, and off into positive and negative space. And that's all that there is to it. It's a single line definition. As I said when I was talking about the spot info node, we should all be familiar with the fact, of course, that polygons face in a given direction, the direction that their normal is pointing. So there's a data type as well, normal direction, normal face direction. And so with that, if I think about it, then since this is just a 0 to 1 value that I'm getting here, if I want this to shade based on the null's position, then I can look along the normal and say, is this normal facing towards the null or not? If it's facing absolutely dead bang on the null, it, this point has a value of 1. If it's facing in completely the opposite direction, give it a value of negative 1. 
and map everything else with a gradient in between. It's easy to think for yourself how you might even go so far as to invent new data types. Obviously, the data type of Y coordinate is provided for us here in the 3D software. Ball has a Y position, it's that simple. And the surface has a Y position relative to the ball's own pivot point, if of course the ball were to be moved. And in that case, that's what this gradient is based on. It's being based on the ball's local space, not the world space. The thing is, on my possible inputs here, I have no am I facing to a given null option. So I am left with the choice to build it myself. That's where we get into the dot product network. And what we get once we hook that up is the face direction of the polygon to the null controlling the shading. Simple as that. Now here, unfortunately, is the point where a lot of artists sort of wig out a little bit, because this doesn't really explain anything so far. How is it that I know to use dot and these particular vectors and so on? We start with the gradient, because that's the thing that we're wanting to be driven by this made up data type that is this normal facing at that null data type. And that's a scalar input. It's expecting a regular number, not a vector or a color or anything like that. You can connect them up, but they might produce weird results. Or well, they definitely will produce weird results, but there you go. The point is, that's what I need to feed into it. Zero through one number. That, of course, is what the dot product releases. A dot product function, or the dot product brush, if you want to call it that, spits out a scalar in the region of negative one to one in the majority of cases. You can get it to go beyond it again. It's unusual, but that is what dot product does from a pair of vectors. Now, how do I know that about dot product? Well, I guess, you know, you just read on it. You look at it, find that it's a scalar output, read what it does and see what dot product is. And it may or may not make much sense. But there you go. I'm going to explain dot product and how to do it. And then, of course, there are many other functions that you can look up yourself. Ones we've already looked at, like multiply. Of course, you still have add, subtract, divide, and so on. If nothing else, they're easy to plug in and see their effects. The next question is how I know to use vectors. Why am I choosing this vector from the null, that's what the item info is looking at, and the vector from the spot info node on this sphere surface here. Well, I'm doing it because, of course, you remember that I was talking about the data types for these points on the surface of the spheres, or the direction of the vectors that come out from direction they're pointing, the magnitude of them, so on and so forth. Well, the null, which is out in space, also has a vector to the origin. In my scene, as it's set up, the sphere and the null both have a common origin. They're both scene children, so both of them have origin 0, 0, 0. And the sphere is centered, so its center is at 0, 0, 0. What I wind up with is a direction to the null and a direction to a point on the sphere surface. And I can look at the angle between these two directions. If I take a plain old graph, which is what 3D space is, a 3D graph, and I have two vectors vectors inside of it going off at different directions. Then as I've explained in my other video, you can have all sorts of data, their own angle to the origin, angle between them, so on. You can have their average derive a third vector that is the average of the two of them. This is all very simple and easy to understand. People, of course, say, well, I don't get it in 3D space. To an extent, you don't have to. If you imagine two arrows pointing up in two different directions and sticking a third in the ground and in 3D space sort of trying to point it so as it's a, a approximately an average between the two, that's close enough to be able to visualize in your mind. It's a bit rough and ready, but there you go. You can sort of just have faith in it. If it works on a 2D representation, then it will also work on a 3D representation. The principle is no different. You get the idea of an angle between, pretty simple, angle to origin, yada yada. All of these different pieces of angle information, and of course, length or magnitude information about how long or short a given vector is and so on. The point is, if we can compare the angle of one to the angle of another, then in this sense here, when the angle coming in to a spot is equal to the angle of the null direction, we can say that this equals zero because there is zero difference. Whereas for a spot here, whose angle is greatly different, it's a bigger value, one. And like that, we can map our gradient across our sphere's surface. Part of the problem that might be 
evident upon further thinking about it for some folks is the fact that of course here we're looking at a zero to one value between you know whatever range or turn in this curve here but if we're looking at angles then that comes out at you know so many degrees doesn't it how do we get from the degrees or rather the x y z of a vector to a zero to one representation to an extent we don't need to worry about it because that's what the dot product does for us it converts one to the other but it is possible to even understand how that is done in a graphical sense the dot product if we remember the description of it is the cosine of the angle between two vectors so here we've got two vectors angle between them find which we'll call a and so the dot product is the cosine of that which is cos a, which is great if you know what cosine is. It doesn't really much artistic sense, seeing as it is a mathematical thing, but it does make plenty of artistic sense. If you have a circle and it has a center point, consider that the origin and we have finding here. We can measure the circle in terms of its top to bottom diameter here as well, draw lines off this away. We can then say, for instance, this is wonderfully straight, isn't it? I'm doing a great job here. Um, we can say that this can be equal to 1. Negative. Any angle or vector, x, y, z, that we draw off can then be assigned a point on this graph and a value between 0 and 1. Sine works, basically. It's a slide ruler, but done on a circle. This is sine. Cosine, the same thing at a 90 degree phase. So cosine sits this way because of course each angle also has a on this side and that is your cosine value there. So you take the angle between two things, you plot, 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 find its cosine value and there you go. That is the dot product of the angle between. Now what you will find if you nip on over to Wikipedia, there's some wonderful little graphics that illustrate all of the different aspects of sine, cosine, tangent, etc., etc., etc. We're not going to go through them all here now that you get the basic idea that there's a, a geometric representation for these things, a way to actually solve them with a, you know, a piece of paper, a compass, and a, a ruler or something. Um, start to apply them much more easily. Of course, the sine wave that you see here is so cool because as you plot out the different angular points on the graph across an axis here, they a wave. The point is that these things produce visual patterns which you can use within your work to drive many things from surface functions, displacements, rigging, and any other thing of that nature. So basically every point, every spot on the surface is looking out in a given direction like this along its normal, and with the null up here on this vector, the spot on the surface whose vector the same as that for the null, it gets a 1. Point on the surface whose vector pointed away from the null, we get zero gradation in between and as the sphere stays still whilst the null moves that one to zero mapping dragged around graphically it all makes great sense it's all very simple so I know I want to get every point on the surface of the sphere and find out which way it is facing which of course is the same vector as that point has relative to the sphere's center in this particular node network that is known as the object spot descriptions of what the different data types are and mean can of course be found in the manuals for the different softwares a lot of times they'll be very similar sometimes they may well be different there you go I've known and figured out how to how to look up that particular type of data got the nulls vector here of course which I've done via the item info and I've got its position which is its position relative to its parent in this case the C of course we have to remember to think in the sense of the 3d package that is seen space for the null or whatever its parent would be if of course I move the sphere you'll notice that its shading doesn't change it stays exactly the same no longer tracks with the null that's because I'm using the object spot and that object spot isn't changed because the spot hasn't changed relative to its own center using the world spot instead gives a very different effect as we can see it's still not the one that we're after. Normally, of course, we'd stick with object spot, parent the null to the ball. Of course, you can see that in my network, I'm using these normalized nodes to normalize the vectors that are coming along here. Again, folks would ask, you know, how it is that I know to insert these in. Of course, it's very simple to realize that it's there. Think closely about the data types that you have available 
and how you can break them down, or look up terms like vector, which aren't of course explained in manuals and so forth. You can easily find that one of the things that's differing here other than the angle between these two vectors, the length of them, or the magnitude, this vector is much longer than this one. And we know in our null example that we don't want the position of the null to have any effect on the shading of the surface. We only care about the face direction, not the magnitude. And so we know that what we want is a way to kill off of the null reading, so as it's always the same as that. of. And really, the easiest way to do it is to normalize. A normalized function simply turns any vector's magnitude to 1. So by normalizing each of the two vectors, that we effectively eliminate their magnitudes from the equation. This means that our dot product based solely on the two vectors and how similar or different that is. And of course once you've got a foothold on working then you can look at other nodes in their descriptions and try and tease details about them out as well. Once you're familiar with the data types and how they need to be connected up you can hook up new tools and see the effects you get. For instance here we're using a distance node to do pretty much the same thing. The distance node simply gets the distance between two, in this case the null and a point on the surface, and the effect is very similar in many ways. Again, results need to be normalized in order that the actual distance of the null from the surface overall doesn't change the shade. Not normalizing the inputs will of course produce a result that fades out the further away. Now of course whilst this example is nice and all there's so many different function math functions for scalar and there's trig and vector stuff and explaining them all or of course all of the different situations you can use them in is quite huge not to mention all of the shaders procedurals and so on with a more artistic eye. Hopefully once you get used to using the tools and the data types with the more artistic mindset you'll find that reading the descriptions of a lot of nodes in your doc will start to make more sense about the types of information that you're getting from the C. And lots of the math dot products, cross products, sine, cosine, looking all of these things up online will give you lots of very simple visual examples that explain basics of what they're doing and how you can use them and their values to describe the aspects of certain things or to describe certain behaviors, patterns and so on. Finding and learning the information is easy enough and a bit of time and perseverance but once you reject the idea that it's somehow all techy or mathy or whatnot in these node editors you'll find them a lot more friendly to get on with. And so I hope that helps explain an awful lot of it to those who found themselves in the dark about nodes. And there we have it. So thank you very much. At half an hour.